Good morning. This lecture is about Teddy Roosevelt, his wives, and his children. And I have a little bit of a broader focus with this lecture, and it'll probably be a little bit longer. But I wanted to, there's several things that I want to talk to you about. If we were in a class together, a physical class like I've had before with this course, we would, we would have a lot of wonderful conversations about TR and what he represented and what his family represented. There's so much history packed into one family. And of course, you know, a uh, cousin to Eleanor and Franklin. It's just amazing. It's amazing uh, how much history is packed into this uh, New York dynasty family. I want to say first, I want to begin by saying this. I was, I heard in graduate school that women shouldn't always do women's history that in fact, we should distinguish ourselves by doing history. And it was said a little more eloquently than I've put it. Uh, Rosie Laudermilk did a wonderful paper, capstone paper on Queen Elizabeth I and her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots. And she was worried, did my advice, was she running counter to that advice? And I said, absolutely not because their place in history was unique largely because they were women and they had such dynamic personalities. And she wasn't writing to try to force history into a feminist perspective. And I think that's really the message there. As historians, as historians, we uh, as women, and Carrington, this might be what you do, um, as historians, we as women, can teach about women, we can teach about the unique role of women in, in history, but it doesn't mean that that perspective colors everything. A prime example of this, and neither does it mean that we have to, I guess this is the bigger point, to squelch our, fem our feminine, not our feminist, but our feminine perspective. There's an, uh, a historian named Kathleen Dalton, and she wrote a biography of Teddy Roosevelt called A Strenuous Life, a play on his autobiography, The Strenuous Life. And she, you, you can tell within the first paragraph that the authorship is a woman, not because she's, you know, dove off the uh, plank and, and into some waters of a deep, you know, feminist perspective. Absolutely not. But you can tell that she sees him, she is seeing him through a woman's eyes. And it's marvelous. And I think that that's a blessing to history and the historical record. We do not have to write as a feminist. We do not have to try to write like men write. We can write through the unique sensitivities that our gender uh, possesses, that were given to us by our creator. And I, I, I don't know how much, how much better that can be. So, I think that this is something that as a new role that we should carve out for ourselves as historians. And I was really pleased with Kathleen Dalton's work. So if you ever get a chance to read that, um, I've taught the presidency class when Dr. Justice had other teaching responsibilities and I would always require that book and that opened up um, some unique conversations. So anyway, let's get into the life of Teddy Roosevelt and to his marriages and his children, because this is just such rich material, and I think um, you will enjoy it. Teddy Roosevelt was born into a very privileged family. His family was very wealthy. He was very close, particularly to his father, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., and he loved his mother dearly, Martha Bullock Roosevelt, uh, Georgia Bell, and at a, they were married at a time, and Teddy was growing up at a time when that wasn't the easiest thing in the world, was to have a mother whose brothers fought for the Confederacy. But that's the way it was, and he was close to both of them. He described his father as the best man I ever knew. I just love that. And um, he's, he described his mother as a sweet, gracious, beautiful Southern woman, entirely unreconstructed to the day of her death. And in fact, she donated food, money, and clothing to the Confederate cause during the war. And uh, it's very interesting, uh, that, mar or that marriage, that relationship. And Teddy, in his life, he is such, 
a larger than life figure, such an enigma, such a, a, a portrait of personal determinism. He had a debilitating asthma as a young child and it nearly killed him on several occasions. His father would take him out at night when he would start coughing and he wouldn't be able to breathe. His father would take him out into the cool night air and sometimes when you have a colicky baby that works and it was that that wisdom was applied here to try to clear his lungs get it you know and it it would work and one night in just desperation his father had taken him out riding trying to to get him where his son could breathe and he told him he said you're going to have to make up your mind to live or not and you know this is something for a young man 11 or 12 years old to 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 take into his that, that he would be responsible for a will to live. And his father, you know, again, they're very wealthy. They went on a cruise and his father had the money and the wherewithal to purchase what you and I would think of as exercise equipment to put in on the ship. And every day, um, Ted, Theodore Jr., Teddy was, Teddy was um, an affectation that we have later. And actually it was said TD. But uh, Theodore Jr. would diligently work every day um, to try to build himself up. And it began a lifestyle, a commitment to a lifestyle of strenuous living where he, tr he put everything he had into everything he did to the best of his ability. There were a few things in his life where he couldn't face the grief or the sadness. But other than those, everything he did, he did it with a gusto, a real use, appropriate use of that word with a gusto that we can only aspire to. And I believe that that prolonged his life and saved his life. And he owed that to his father and to the Lord. And um, President Roosevelt is a man of Christian faith, deep abiding Christian faith. And um, it's amazing to see. Sadly, uh, the strain of alcoholism runs through that family as we saw with the Adams family and uh, the Pierce family. It's there and his brother, Teddy's Rose brother, Teddy Roosevelt's brother, Elliot, uh, who was the father of Eleanor Roosevelt, will suffer from the, what we call morbid alcoholism and he will literally uh, bring about his end of his life uh, through, through that and the end of his marriage. Everything was very, very sad, uh, very sad story. And uh, Elia, uh, um, Theodore was just always appalled by his brother's behavior and uh, didn't know what to do to help him. But if I'm not careful, well, this will be a three-hour lecture, so I apologize for that. In 1880, Teddy Roosevelt was captivated by the beautiful Alice Hathaway Lee, and they are married. And this surprised everyone. He had been attached to Edith Caro, C-A-R-O-W, and something happened between the two of them, and we don't know for sure what, but something happened, and perhaps on the rebound, he married Alice. Alice is uh, an intriguing figure because we know so little about her. If you read A Strenuous Life by Kathleen Dalton, you'll have some insight into her. She doesn't come off very well. And it seems as if their marriage might have been maybe perhaps not as successful as some others. Uh, even Edith, his second wife, felt that she was no way she could have kept up with him. And I, I tend to think that to be true. And um, she was sort of uh, a vain, and I don't mean that as unkindly as it sounds, but a, a vain sort of, vapid is way too strong, but uh, you know, someone who was more con um concerned with fashion and clothes and dress and her hair and all these things. I, I don't know that impression could be wrong. So don't take me to the bank on that. But she tragically will die. Um, and in this, if this isn't a cruel turn of fate on, on St. Valentine's day in 1884, she, she had Bright's disease, which we'll see again with the first Mrs. Wilson. Um, this was an incurable kidney disease. And she suffered from that. And when she gave birth to their only child, to, to baby Alice, she will be a baby Alice, she died from complications 
of the stress of the birth and in the bride's disease. And the same day, Teddy Roosevelt's mother dies. So, I mean, how much can one man stand uh, within two days, or with, excuse me, within 24 hours, he lost the two great lights of his life. And he said, there's a quote that's attributed to him, the lights of my life are gone. And it's very heartbreaking. And his mother died of typhoid fever, which was not unusual for that, for that time. Rather than throwing himself into caring for baby Alice, he gave, um, gave over the care of Alice to his sister. And I think that that may have been a mistake. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then he went out west to the Dakota Territory. He wanted to just write books about history because, like all great men, he was a historian. He, he wanted to write books about history and travel the unspoiled American West. And he would never discuss publicly his first wife. He was rather Jeffersonian in his approach to his grief. It was as if she never existed. No pictures of her were allowed in the house. And don't look at that as cold-hearted. That is just a way of dealing with um, unfathomable grief. In the background this entire time is Edith. They had had everything in common. Um, and everybody, as I said a second ago, everybody thought um, that they would surely be married. And again, everyone was shocked with Alice. Uh, and when Alice died, Theodore told his family that he believed that a man should marry only once in life and that he would never remarry. He initially refused to have anything to do with Edith and she didn't want anything to do with him. But the next year in September, he's back home at his sister's house visiting her and baby Alice. And this is September. Edith comes to the house and in November, he proposes to her. They wait and marry the next year in 1886, and I believe they have one of the most fabulously successful marriages in this whole pantheon of first ladies and their presidential husbands. This is just amazing. She had what it took. She knew him. She loved him, and she had the interpersonal energy to keep up with him, and I love that. She... She was loved by the Roosevelt family. They knew her, but she was her own woman, and she wanted to take over the raising of Alice. And Alice's time with, you know, I'm not a child psychologist, but Alice's time with her aunt probably spoiled her irretrievably. And Edith probably saved her in many ways from a more difficult life. But it was always very difficult to deal with Alice. And I want to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to talk some about the presidential children here because it is such a fascinating story. Um, when President McKinley dies and T.R. becomes president, Alice is old enough to be causing some trouble. She's born in 1884, 1901, so look, that's at the heart of 16, 17 years old. And Alice was a handful, willful, disobedient. She never felt that she had her, her father's love. And I can understand that. I don't, I don't believe it's true, but he never really came to know her the way he did the other children, and, um, I, and I'm going to talk about the other children here in a few minutes, uh, or at least some of them, but Alice was always someone who was just at war within herself, and um, I think her life was so difficult, and she's a class into herself. There was one point when, um, when he was president, someone said to, to Roosevelt, well, can't you rein Alice in? And he said, I can, as president of the United States, I can run the country or I can take care of Alice. I can't do both. And when Alice marries, uh, nobody's happy, happier, I think, to see her marry than Edith. 
And Edith tells her, you know, I've loved you. I've loved you. And I love you as if you were my own daughter. But I'm really glad that somebody else is going to have to deal with you now. And, you know, um, I don't, I understand that. I, I, underst I understand how Edith must have felt, not from an empathetic point of view, but from a sympathetic. Alice craved attention. No amount of attention was ever um, en enough. Edith hoped desperately to teach her to be a model of dignity and modesty, but it just resulted in her running completely in the other direction. Um, she married Nicholas Longworth, who was a congressman, eventually rising to the position of Speaker of the House, which was very, very important. They don't stay married, and um, she had her own daughter. They had a daughter named Paulita, um, excuse me, Paulina, and um, I, I, um, gosh, I, I think there's some speculation that there was a very difficult relationship between Alice and her own daughter. And her own daughter will later in life um, take her own life. Paulina had a daughter that Alice, towards the end of Alice's life, became closer to, but eventually will be estranged. It's like everyone that came into Alice's life will eventually be estranged. And I think that's just so sad. And what's interesting about Alice, another, this, is, this is interesting. Alice will become... I think queen of the cave dwellers. And do you remember that term? That is those who are who are permanent fixtures within Washington DC social circles who live to gossip and backbite and measure uh, all of those wives and politicians that come into the nation and not by measure them not by very moral standards. And <clears throat> Alice will become notorious for being a center of all gossip and she she is now i'm not sure if this is true but she supposedly had a cushion and in which it was stitched um, what was a, a little saying that's ascribed to her now do not take this as gospel as she being the originator of this she says if you don't have something good to say about somebody come and sit next to me now I don't know really if she's the originator of that, but supposedly she had a cushion in her home that said that, and that was her philosophy. She made Eleanor Roosevelt's life hellish. She constantly made fun of um, what she 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 perceived as as Eleanor's unattractiveness. When Nellie Taft was in the White House. Nellie hated her coming to the White House because of things. Um, I will go ahead and tell you because I'm not sure we'll get to a lecture on this. I would love to. But Nellie uh, had a stroke while in the White House, and it was very difficult for her to bring her speech back and her, her ability to function. And unfortunately, you know, Alice will get a hold of that and belittle her and, and Nellie didn't want her in the White House at all. And Will was captivated by her and thought Will Taft was captivated by her and said, I don't understand your problems with Alice. But Alice is a very tragic figure and I, you know, that's heartbreaking. And it could be, it could all go back to, you know, unfortunately, it could all go back to that time she had away from her father being, you know, feeling that perhaps he didn't love her the way he loved the children that he had with Edith. And I don't necessarily think that it was a love issue, but it might be a familiarity issue. He just didn't know what to do with her. And she had become so willful in that short time that he had, that she had with Roosevelt's sister, Bambi. And so um, Alice is just a, she's a figure into herself. Now, what I want to do on this lecture I want to tell you, first of all, I've gone so much into this, there are quite a few children that Edith, I want to give you a list, and uh, then we're going to talk about them, and, and then I want to, uh, this is less about Edith's success as a, um, or, and she was a successful first lady by any measure, but it's less about them as, as much about their family life. So I want to give you a list of the children, and then I want to go back and talk about them, if you'll indulge me on this. The oldest child that Theodora and Edith had 
was Theodore Jr., born in 1887, and he died in 1944. He actually was a military figure who was part of the D-Day landings, and even at that age, 44 plus uh, 13, 57, so he was a little bit younger than me, and he is on uh, he is he is on the beachhead and dies of a heart attack um, as a result of the strenuousness of the landing. Uh, there's Kermit. Edith's name was Edith Kermit Caro Roosevelt. There was Kermit, who lived from 1889 to 1943. A lovely daughter, Ethel, 1891 to 1977. Archibald Bullock, 1894 to 1979. Quentin, about whom we'll talk quite a bit, 1897 to 1918. And look at that date, American involvement in World War I. And then um, Alice, who 1884 who lives actually into my generation, 1980. Let's talk about the kids a little bit because this is so interesting. Uh, there is a wonderful book out there. If you, you're interested in it at all, I will send you the bibliographic information, but it's about the president's children, all of the presidential children. And uh, Dr. Justice and I have both leaned very heavily on it and, and putting our classes together. And it's a marvelous, it's a marvelous collection of little mini M-I-N-I biographies. Theodore Jr. again was the first of their children in many ways like his father. He was Harvard educated. Um, he was a military hero in both world wars and he won more medals than anybody could count. He served as governor of Puerto Rico and the Philippines like his father and his cousin, um, Franklin, he will serve as Assistant Secretary of Navy, um, and he was Omar, Omar Bradley, a great uh, general of World War II, declared that his fighting and leadership skills were the single bravest he had ever witnessed um, in the war. And I think, wow, that's really something. Kermit was born again 1889 and lived in 1943. He also was Harvard educated. He had his father's love of adventure, um, but unfortunately, he suffers from that strain of alcoholism that ran through his father, I mean, through the family side. Um, he also had, unfortunately, the drug of the day was opium, and he had an opium addiction. He was married and had four children. Um, he held um, successful political positions and he was said to have died from dysentery, but that may have been a polite cover from um, the fact that he died from suicide. Um, terribly sad. Excellent, excellent character in every way other than the substance abuse. Um, heartbreaking, heartbreaking. You know that had to be hard to, hard to watch because um, our beloved Edith lives until eight, 1948, so she sees the death of some of her children. Ethel, I think many ways, Ethel was um, her father's daughter. There was so much of Teddy in Ethel. She was fearless, loving, playful, and a favorite of the American public during the White House years. She married a doctor, and they had four children, and she actually served as one of the courageous ambulance drivers in Paris in World War I. Um, and she, she was an uh, avid supporter of Richard Nixon when he ran against JFK in 1960. So there's a lot of very interesting things about Ethel. And then Archibald Bullock Roosevelt, another businessman and war hero, outspoken against communism. Uh, he felt that uh, Truman was soft on communism, very wives, uh, very outspoken in that. He suffered from alcoholism, but he fought it very publicly and bravely through Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, he, he, he had an unfortunate car accident, I believe driving under the influence in which his wife died. And he doesn't enjoy a particularly uh, positive reputation in some circles. I'm not sure that that's... Uh, uh, fair. Um, I think in many ways, too, he was his father's son, but also his uncle's nephew. So there's much out there about Archibald still to be discovered. Quentin. I want to talk about Quentin, the youngest of the sons. Um, 
Archibald had served in the 94th Aero, um, which was the, the early air forces in World War One, with uh, the flying here, Amer Eddie Rickenbacker. So the kids had the kids had all proven themselves militarily education. And then Quentin is the baby. And Quentin might have been um, a favorite of the mothers of Edith's. I don't, I don't want to say that with certainty, but he was babied. And TR always felt that Quentin was a little soft. And to quell the criticism of his brothers and maybe his father's view of him, Quentin joined the fledgling Army Air Corps, like his brother um, Archibald had done. And he, Sally, he, he sailed, sailed through the rigors of the physical testing. Um, and he uh, aced an eye exam. The Roosevelt's were notorious for having poor eyes, eyesight. He aced the eye exam by memorizing the charts. So, yes, he cheated. But it was all to get this position so he could fly. When Quentin first arrived on the American front in World War I, his commander was, um, like his brother, Kim, uh, Andy Riggenbacher, and, and he was, um, there were some that, that thought he was an empty shirt, that he would be somebody that um, simply had a, a family name and wouldn't amount to anything. But they found out immediately that Quentin was a man of substance and flying skill. Rickenbacker later wrote about Quentin, describing him as, quote, a hearty and absolutely square in everything he did or said. He said Quentin Roosevelt was one of the most popular fellows in the group. We loved him fiercely for his own natural self. And when you say square, if you remember, Teddy Roosevelt's known for the, you know, a square deal. Um, um, It was a word saying that everything is on the up and up. Everything is just. Everything is what you see. So um, Quentin on his missions proved himself fearless, but sometimes reckless, as if he had something to prove. In Carrington, we see this again with the Kennedy boys. Joe Kennedy Jr., who was always his father's favorite, and always the one that Joe Sr. believed would be the first Catholic president, he took on a suicide mission in which he was killed. And I always feel that, that John also took on daring um, missions to get dad's approval. So you see this, and that's kind of painful. I, now, that's the last comparison I'll make between these two families or the two fathers. But on one occasion, Quentin will scare his squad members to death by separating from them. Remember, you flew in formations so that you weren't um, uh, you weren't um, isolated and been easily picked off. Uh, this was sort of mentality that took place on the sea as well. But he veered off to pursue a German plane, and he was successfully shot the plane down. But this is very, uh, excuse me, dramatic circumstances, um, and he will known he'll be known for doing this, and he'll make a practice of it, and he's always very successful. And unfortunately, he will do something similar to this one time too many. His, in July of 1918, uh, Quentin will be part of a five-plane squadron and engage a seven-plane German unit known as the Flying Aces. Um, and this is led by none other than the infamous Hermann Goering, who will be the father of the German Luftwaffe in World War II. Uh, the engagement, despite the, the slight difference in number, uh, the engagement was fairly even until a second German squadron came in from behind the American position. So Quentin will turn his plane directly at them to engage them and keep them away from the American squadron so the American squadron could would have time to regroup. Um, so um, 
this will result in Quentin's plane being shot down. Supposedly, he died before the plane hit the ground. The Germans um, will recover his body in France, and they buried him, and I'll bro get broken up about this story more than once. They will bury him with honors for his bravery, and um, they will plant a cross there and drape his dog tags on the cross. Later, when Americans find the grave, uh, they added some white stones lovingly around the grave um, and, and make a new cross. And after D-Day, Quentin's body will be exhumed and, and like his brothers at Omaha Beach, they will, they will be brought back. Now, um, well, let me rephrase that. I'm so sorry. They will be buried there. Um, he will be buried with his brother there in France together. T.R. never recovered from this. And he believes um, that he is responsible for Quentin's death, for pushing him to do something like this. But I want to tell you another part of the story. T.R. will die just months after this. But I want to tell you another part of the story. And I will cry telling you, but it's amazing. As you probably remember from American History 2 or from the presidency class, Roosevelt fulfills McKinley's term, is re-elected in 1904 in his own right, and then his hand-picked successor in 1908 is our beloved Will Taft. Something happened between the two during Taft's administration and they had a falling out. Part of it was um, TR just felt that Taft wasn't doing what he himself would have done as president. And part of it was probably some jealousy that he wasn't in the office himself. Um, T.R. did have that character flaw. It was said of him that he was the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. And so in 1912, you know that, Ta I'm sorry, that T.R. will come back and run, not as the Republican candidate, but as the Bull Moose Party candidate, fracturing the Republican vote, most likely costing Taft re-election with which he was very grateful for. <laughs> he didn't want to be president anymore. That's what Nellie wanted him to be. He just wanted to be on the Supreme Court and bless him, he will be appointed to the Supreme Court by Warren Harding in 1920. Um, but Wilson will win because of that fracture and the, and the two didn't speak. T.R. and Taft did not speak. But I want to say they had a brotherly love for one another. One evening after Quentin's death, um, the Roosevelts were dining out, and coincidentally, the Tafts were at the same restaurant. And Taft, being a man of such fine character, got up from his table and went over to the Roosevelts to express his heartfelt condolences over the death of Quentin not knowing how T.R. would receive him. And the men, see, I'll cry talking about this, but the men stood up, or, or T.R. stood up to greet him, and they embraced. Now, that was very unusual for that day to do that publicly. Everyone watching was just mesmerized, and they stood up and clapped because these two great men these brothers in the political arms, their friendship was restored through this tragedy. That's the beauty of American history, is to see this mosaic of biography, to see these lives of human beings, of great men who steer the course of the nation and yet have such personal feelings that are as deep as our own. And I know that um, at this time of at this time of TR's life, his health was so bad, and Edith worried about him. And I tell you truly, um, TR felt that Wilson had done a miserable job 
in delaying getting into the war. He was um, always showing up, trying to tell Wilson what to do, and that sounds perfectly like TR, but he would, um, he really wanted to go into battle himself. <laughs> That's just such classic Teddy Roosevelt. And Edith was there um, the whole time. And uh, I, I just think it took a tremendous woman <laughs> who was prepared for this strenuous life, um, and she certainly was. So I hope that, um, it looks to me like I received some of your beautiful work today. I hope that um, you will take a close look when you have the opportunity at both of these, and I will send you the link or send you the bibliographical information about um, um, the, the Dalton book about a strenuous life because I, I really think that's one that you would enjoy having in your library and um, I drew some rich details for this lecture into that uh, for that so get a chance um, you know look more at, at Edith and look more at this beautiful story between the Tafts and the and the Roosevelt's so anyway um, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that this is something that you um, 